Welcome to Homo Events, the channel on history and board games. In this video, we will look at Sankore, a game that was recently published by Osprey Games that takes place in the Mali Empire under the rule of Mansa Musa uh, in the early 14th century. He was one of the richest and most powerful men in history. And his story is actually not that well known, I would say, or at least not at all portrayed in board games regularly. His reign was remarkable for the fact that Mansa Musa developed uh, quite an extensive trade network and had also a very profound um, cultural significance. Uh, and this is what uh, lays the groundwork for the theme of this game. Sankore itself uh, was an academic hub in Timbuktu and was a beacon of Islamic learning and scholarship, attracting scholars and intellectuals from all over the Islamic world. I had the privilege to have uh, the game designers uh, coming over the show to record an interview for us to chat about how they approach historical research and how they embedded that research into the game. Because even though it is a Euro game, I feel like it is significantly different from other Euro games in the sense that my perception is that it takes its topic a bit more seriously and maybe think about the theme first and mechanics second. One of the things that I was also particularly interested in is that uh, the designers worked with cultural consultants, uh, one of whom is historian uh, Mauro Nobili. And I believe that Mauro's expertise in uh, pre-colonial and early colonial West African history brought some quite interesting historical background, a good thematic backbone uh, to the game itself. This deep understanding of the political and intellectual history of the region I think, potentially, but we will see what the designers say, uh, enriched uh, the theme of Sankore. In this interview, we'll delve into the intricate mechanics of the games and how it captures the essence of what Mansa Musa was trying to do culturally in this era uh, and the challenges of balancing historical accuracy uh, with an engaging gameplay. I believe this is going to be the first of a series of video on the game. So this one will be the interview. Uh, next week, uh, we should have a teach and play with the designers of Sankori. So keep an eye on the schedule on the channel to see when it's happening, but I guess it should be on Tuesday. Uh, it will be confirmed and you can follow me on Twitter to make sure that you don't miss anything. And if everything goes well, I might even do a video review, which might be unexpected, haven't done in a while some of those, uh, but I decided that in 2024, I will come back to reviewing, uh, and this maybe might be the first one or the second, who knows. But yeah, I hope you'll enjoy, and let's jump into the discussion. I'll start by saying, Mandela, Fabio, thanks a lot for taking the time for answering a few of my questions uh, regarding the historical context of Sankore, your latest game that was uh, released by Osprey Game. I think the first question that I have for you, and I think would be useful for the people uh, listening to this interview is, could you maybe share a bit of the historical context uh, of Sankore? Um, and why did you choose this particular era and location as a theme for, for a game? I think Fabio is in the, in the best position to start with that, yeah. <laughs> Sure. Yes, uh, I've always uh, been fascinated by history outside of Europe because, as a school, I always always studied the, the European view of history. And so later, I discovered the rest of the world, and now I'm interested in what happened there. And so, like Mer, so San Korea was an interesting uh, subject. And so, I wanted to make a game about uh, a different perspective of. Um, knowledge and science and, uh, and so the University of Korea looked like a good uh, opportunity to learn. So there was this this interest in maybe shifting away from, I would say, m most of the Euro games that are focused on a very Eurocentric uh, vision of history to go and explore other moments. I think right. that, that makes a, a, a lot of sense. And I was wondering, were there any particular challenges uh, you faced in depicting that period in terms of research, for example, because I guess that maybe most of the documents that you had access to, even if they were not Eurocentric in their approach, might have been Europe, written by European scholars based on European sources. So what were the types of challenges that you were confronted in in approaching this topic? I think you've absolutely struck on one of the key issues in doing the research is not only are you limited in the sources that are available because, you know, some of those things just don't exist and maybe a lot of the histories are oral histories in particular areas uh, and there is some argument that's been made that some of the recorded histories as well are already even at the time 
uh, that they took place were infused with some kind of bias, particularly around Mansa Musa, for example, um, some indication that maybe some of that's to, to further particular uh, political ideals that people might have had in the area. So there's that issue on top of the fact that neither uh, Fabio nor I speak Arabic or read Arabic, so we're limited in the sources that we can access there immediately and easily, and a lot of those did come from European explorers, you know, Leo Africanus uh, is obviously written a lot there, and you can see through that that it's got this European slant to it. And so I think the, the main way that we could overcome that, or at least keep that in check to some extent, was really by engaging with the cultural consultant and getting further into that, people that directly engaged with the local communities and could read more of the source texts and had read more of the source texts and understood the different arguments on the side of which which history held greater truth uh, through those. Did you work with multiple uh, cultural consultants or uh, so how did it work and did Osprey took part in putting you in contact or was it uh, mostly on yeah. your side? That you so it was uh, it is both. Yes, yeah. so we had two cultural consultants involved in the project. Uh, one of those initially we managed to contact because we reached out basically looking at the sources that we had used and seemed to be most informed about the Timbuktu manuscripts and what was going on in Sankore uh, in modern times, really, so following that through. And I think initially it was possibly an article in The Guardian that was about the, the smuggling of manuscripts out to Bamako uh, from Sankore, because for those that don't know, there's been some terrorist activity that persists in Timbuktu that has led to the destruction of many of the manuscripts. And so there's a, an ongoing effort to try and preserve those in the best way possible. And through those articles, uh, we reached out, you know, just kind of blindly following leads there, saying to the authors, you know, where did you get uh, these kind of inf bits of information? What are the best sources? where we can get that. And through that, we got uh, put in contact with someone called Mauro uh, Nobili, who, you know, we, I, I'm just kind of in shock as to how well suited his expertise was to our interests. Uh, you know, he has written a book on the Islamic manuscripts of sub-Saharan Africa with a particular interest in Mali, for example, you know, so so this was really something that overlapped mm. strongly with his interests and expertise. So we got him on board and managed to pick his brains quite extensively and discuss with him what we were doing, which was something he was uh, very excited and supportive of, which was great. So in that early stage, um, in that earlier stage, yeah, we had his input. And then when Osprey came on board and had made very clear that they were willing to respect and put some time into having that setting having those cultures depicted appropriately they brought on another uh, consultant Zain Alam who gave his thoughts on the uh, veracity and the sensitivity around the depiction of Islam for example uh, also thinking about not only historical accuracy but how uh, modern you know, practitioners might mm. feel about the depiction mm. there. Mandela, was it your first time working with cultural consultants on a game? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, that was and, and, indeed. And Fabio, was it the same for you? Was it the uh, first no, time you worked with? We already no? worked with consultants, both for uh, Mer and for Zapotec. Yeah. So it's now kind of a normal thing to do. Mm. And it's how one of the hardest uh, steps in the in production of board games is uh, checking and, with and, no and, and, and Fabio, has you had a bit of experience um, uh, designing with both cultural consultants and also designing on your own, what would you say are the main uh, changes to your creative approach? Uh, so, from what uh, It was a bit different for San Correa because we contacted Mauro very early in the process. So we could get some feedback early and get some uh, inputs and directions. While in the previous games, that was more of a after the fact thing where the design's already done and then maybe there is some adjustment here and there to follow some suggestions. But uh, in this case, uh, because we contacted the Mauro ourselves, not through Osprey, we were able to uh, incorporate these inputs in the development phase so before actually finalizing the game with the publisher. So 
Yeah. But so he really he really took part in the in the creative process, which is which is super interesting. In well, a way. Yeah. We 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 show them we show him what we were doing and we asked for uh, you know, clarifications, inputs, directions. It was very excited to help. It was uh, yeah. um, happy that uh, a very obscure mm. corner of history he's working on is actually getting some uh, you know, publicity. So. So, and I have a question because I have I've, uh, I've known a bit about this history for 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 a while, um, and I was wondering, there is no reason for that part of history to be that obscure. Uh, like Mansa Mansa was a pretty spectacular right. and unique character, uh, and I was wondering why do you think this story is that obscure for us? Well, such a not... powerful man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, Mansa Musa is kind of uh, almost a mythical figure, so. People know about him, but uh, like the book two is a shorthand for something very far away and nobody knows where it is. <laughs> At least in my experience, uh, uh, at school, we have already uh, not enough time to cover <laughs> our own history. So I understand why we don't study much about the others. But uh, that's one, one problem because the school focuses too much on the local history and doesn't put things in context. That's why most people don't know much about what happened outside of Europe, in Europe or outside of America, in America and so on. Mm. Yeah, I think also it's almost like uh, what you alluded to in that Mansa Musa was quite a fantastical figure in history. Uh, you know, the, the sheer wealth is difficult to get around and the idea of um, the influence of that empire at the time but as fabio said you know most people are many people um i know don't know that timbuktu is real i think you know uh because it is used as a shorthand in english i'm actually curious i don't know if this is the same in french um but it's a shorthand in english that people say you know from here to timbuktu and many people yeah. think that's a fictitious place it's this you know somewhere impossibly far away uh you know a magical land or something like that so it's almost like some of these things have passed into this kind of mythical realm rather than being addressed in mm -hmm. our understanding of what history is. So I don't think we have exactly the same saying in, in, in French, and that might be because Mali was part of the French colonial empire right. and it was a very real place <laughs> like, uh, that we exploited. Yeah. So you know, it because was not that the, mythical. Yeah. The thing is that uh, before uh, the discovery of America, most of the gold was coming from Mali, right? And uh, but people in Europe could not just go to Timbuktu and get the gold because they didn't know how to get there. You had to cross the Sahara, so nobody knew exactly how to uh, reach this space. And uh, it was kind of a strategical thing to keep it hidden. That's why Mali could uh, be the only one producer or the major producer of gold and exporter of gold in Europe. And keeping secret the location of Timbuktu was one of the way to keep that uh, no, monopoly <laughs> and and maybe to start bringing the conversation more towards uh the connection between history and design we're talking about the the figure the unique figure of Mansa Musa that we said is not that well known in the western world or is more almost seen as a mythological figure but he did have actually actual historical achievements that are quite noteworthy and i was wondering how did you approach representing his presence in the game like he is clearly here with the system of favors and everything but how did you want to represent him and and what what went into the like the design work to 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 represent the achievements of that of that very real person well, I, I would say Mansa Musa is both notably absent from the game, uh, <laughs> but also notably present in the game in, in the way that you mentioned through this system of favors, you're interacting, you know, the depiction of him is there in the law area that he's clearly having this influence. And ultimately it's Musa that you're trying to win, win favor of throughout the game. Uh, and it's driven that way. Earlier on in the design, we were quite keen to have him represented in a more literal way through the game and we tried that through different approaches you know even considering whether his uh, journey his uh, travels to Mecca should be depicted in some way with a physical sort of Mansa Musa moving across the board whether he should be present sort of observing different actions that were taking place so we were initially quite interested and this is where you get a bit of conflict with 
the design and what we could achieve in that whilst keeping it still an engaging game that had sufficient strategy and so on through it. So what we did ultimately is take Musa as a as a sort of avatar that is no longer in the game, but I think as you have alluded to, his presence is very much there. Uh, just to 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 build up on this, and that I think it's also something that struck me really when I when I opened the box and started reading the rule book and figuring out the game is from my experience. So I'm mostly a historical gamer, so I play mostly games that are really heavily focused on history. It's more sort of a niche hobby. And when I open games like this, usually what I will see in your games is that. And I love your games, just to be clear, that what I mostly see is people who are um, designers who are working on mechanics first and then figuring out or maybe have some sort of inspiration of what could be the theme that could fit, that could be a good aesthetic to to package the, the mechanics. When I played this game, I felt something, and I might be wrong, but I felt something quite different in nature in the sense that I really felt like the theme was the foundation for a lot of the way you approach the mechanics and the dynamic between all the different mechanics. Even the traditional um, wheel of resources that you have in a lot of Euro games, you need this to get that and that to get this, and this is the, the even that economy made sense within the context of the theme that I was playing with. The area action makes sense in an abstract way of what is actually happening in terms of development of astrology, laws, mathematics. And I thought it was really interesting. And I wanted to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, was it your primary design philosophy to actually think that, OK, we want to make a game about Sankore and this effort in the Mali Empire to, to, to broaden the scope of um, knowledge, but also maybe have this soft power influence uh, over the rest of the Islamic world, and then think about, okay, what are the Euro mechanics that we have at hand that we can use? I was wondering what was your design process? Because it yes. felt for a player very different. It, it, was, it was very theme first design. Basically, all the mechanisms in the game were added in service of the theme, and not with, we never pick a mechanic and then try to justify it with some uh, story around it. This is the case in many games, although it's not always uh, obvious from the player. Because what happens sometimes is that uh, people focus on the mechanism and then forget that there was a team behind, and then they think that the team was attached after that. But at least in this case, and in other games I worked on, the, the team is always uh, central. So everything has to be kind of somewhat justified. Then you have to, of course, make some compromise, you need to make some abstraction, otherwise the game becomes un unwieldy. But uh, we always like started from the team first, so the resource were the first thing we decided. So we have uh, gold, salt, and books, because this is the what, what was important at the time. We decided the, the four disciplines, and then we tried to figure out what can we do with these disciplines. So, so for you, Mandela, did it also, was it also the case when you were designing Glasgow, or did you feel like Sankori felt like a different creative process? Uh, I think it was a different creative process, definitely. When we talk about designing it from the theme first, I think it is very true as well that it's from the theme rather than just specific elements of the setting. You know, one of the things that we did in, in the very first discussion we had about designing this was pick out, you know, what are the those key themes? Like, you know, if it's a university, it's going to be knowledge that's going to be there and knowledge shouldn't be this kind of tangible thing that you spend but rather knowledge should build on other things and therefore progress as it goes on so it was picking out those key elements of the theme and then trying to find mechanisms that suited those uh that's a bit different from when i designed glasgow which you know i did want to make a game that was uh, going to be an homage to my hometown i'm from glasgow uh, and so wanted something there and then worked in but that was more maybe me thinking about designing a game and finding something which was convenient because if you, uh, before we start recording, Fred, uh, you know, we were just talking a little bit about the housing in the UK and I don't yes. know if you're aware, but in Glasgow was one of Europe's first grid cities, uh, the way it got restructured and laid mm. out starting from this part of Merchant City. So in that case, it was more that I saw that it was a city which was structured in a very particular manner um, yeah. in the 1800s and that that could lend quite nicely to the sort of game I was trying to make. But now moving over to this approach that we did with Sankore, I'm surprised 
that in some regards it's easier to to work from that theme because otherwise you can come up with a hundred ideas and not know which one's the best not know which one to pick from you know there's managing to hold on to something to bring those together can be quite challenging if you don't have this sort of central thesis almost this this guiding uh, light of the theme where you can say okay no what best represents this or this is our restriction uh, and we're working within this boundary and then we can try and come up with mechanisms that better suit that is actually a much easier way to kind of tame the mm -hmm. otherwise wild design process yeah that makes a lot of sense and i had a um... A question because I asked on BGG if people who started engaging with the game or were interested in it, if they had some questions for you, and I tried to add some of them uh, in the flow of the of the question here. And I think that would be a, an interesting build up. So I have a question here from Tassin on that he asked on BGG, asking both Merv and Sankore feature uh, an Islamic setting in the Middle Ages, and he's asking, is this a trilogy or? Uh, you happen to just have design uh, uh, two design that works in a in a, in a setting that are somewhat culturally connected. So that's the first part of his question, and then I have a second part for this question. So is there more games on uh, on on the Islamic world in the Middle Ages that are that are coming? I don't think it was a plan to do like a series of uh, Islam themed games. So we, what we decided in Korea, we weren't yet sure which publisher would pick it up and so on so i don't think it was part of a trilogy originally but then uh, when uh, osprey saw the game they liked it and uh, it felt right to keep the same style of uh, merv and then have a similar graphical layout and so on but uh, and so that was kind of a start of a trilogy but <laughs> the third uh, uh, element will be a bit different, so you know. Mm. <laughs> and, I mean, and there, there are, but there is a third game with we work with Mandela again, but it's not still not uh, final. But uh, it won't be an Islamic uh, game. <laughs> good, good to know. And there is a follow-up question to this. Yeah, linking linking Sankore to um, to Scholars of the South Tigris, uh, which is not the same theme, but has some overlap in uh, which area yes. of the world and, and the kind of approaches that are like what is being depicted in, in the game. And I think there is a wider question around, do you see like this interesting evolution in uh, what your games uh, are covering overall, maybe a bit less uh, colonialism process like you would see in Puerto Rico and actually exploring other histories in, in, in new ways. Do you see, think that there is a, like a wider movement overall? Well, it's more or less forced, but yes. Because <laughs> I don't think, uh, um, you know, that period is tricky to deal with. And uh, it's uh, not, uh, I, mean, I don't see many more games based on colonialism or like Western centric views. Forward, uh, you future, would be surprised. So. That there are, there are I would be surprised. Like, like, if they keep, yeah. I don't know, but uh, uh, it feels like uh, this is uh, now over. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's the end of a, of an era. Okay. Uh, let's hope you're yeah, right. I mean, uh, not, uh, I'm not convinced. I mean, no. but, it's yeah. like uh, uh, there is a more sensibility now uh, for these things that there was like 10 years ago. Yeah, that's true. Uh, it's quite different. And uh, maybe to close on the topic of uh, Mansa Musa, so his initiative was to expand the software of the Empire of Mali. And we play as players, as people who are working toward that uh, goal. Would you say that historically he actually achieved in that endeavor of uh, making uh, the Mali Empire shine through the Islamic world? Or what, what was the, uh, the actual historical outcome of the game, you could say? Well, it lasted un un until he lasted. Then uh, his uh, <laughs> projects didn't do as well. So. So, it's, 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 so players have to keep this in mind. It might be all for nothing. That's what that's what you're saying. Right, but uh, I mean, the University of San Correa still exists. So at least, uh, pro, I mean, because there are two things. There is the, the glory of the empire, in a way, which went up and down. But then there is also the prestige of the university, which is still going on, because the university has still been working for like 10 years. One way to look at the game is that uh, the Mansa Musa goes to Mecca, uh, and on his way back, decides that he wants to increase the prestige of the University of San Correa. So 
he brings some scholars from uh, Cairo, from uh, Alexandria, and you know, all the other places, and bring them to uh, San Corea to improve the school. So the players are the scholars that come from other universities to increase, improve the prestige of uh, San Korea. And then at the end of the game, the prestige of San Korea was higher than at the start because you know, lots of achievements. So from the player's point of view, this is okay. Like they are scholars, they are teaching and they are getting their students graduated. Then what happened to Mali after that? <laughs> It's not the Holland there. Uh, th there was there was something you hinted uh, towards uh, Fabio when we were talking about Merv, and that's the the, the graphical connection. And I was mm -hmm. really interested to talk about the visual art of it. So of course, Ian O'Toole has been working on this. I think his work is pretty amazing <laughs> on, yes. on on this one. It's quite fascinating. But I was also wondering how did you work with Ian uh, to guide him in making sure that the vision uh, that you had for the game and the setting actually came to life. When you see the game, you see that there is a lot of care. Like it feels like there is a lot of care in the in the graphical depiction. How did this process went? Because it's slightly different than pure game design. We're really talking about the aesthetics, but it really feels like the aesthetics are serving the the, the theme of the game. So how was that relationship? Yes, well, it was uh, indirect in a way because uh, basically the publisher in the end is the one giving a brief to the illustrator to do the illustration of the graphic design. So we were involved in how this brief was prepared and sent to Ian. And then, yes, we had some feedback on his early proofs. And, uh, but we didn't, I mean, it's not uh, under the control of the designer. Most of these days under the control of the publisher. But we have a very good relationship with the space, so we were involved, but that's not always the case. I mean, okay. Ian is obviously, uh, I man of immense talent that you can see there but uh something maybe people don't see behind the scenes is his commitment in those depictions and he clearly went off and did a lot of research himself yes. and he threw ideas back to us and we did get to um you know run things over and we ran those past our cultural consultants as well to make sure mm -hmm. uh, there was nothing going astray there but he he did his homework to to put it simply and you'll see when you look at the board not only is it mm. uh, very nice but also hopefully very functional that was one of the major mm. considerations of getting somebody who could nail the graphic and design because it's quite a complicated game but you can see on some areas of the game board there is some of the geometric art which is taken from the timbuktu manuscripts for example and i mm. don't think anybody you know specifically said to him go out and look at those manuscripts and and copy the pieces there mm -hmm. but that's the sort of care that he clearly takes in his work and i know from uh when we did discuss with him he had some concerns about deviating too much from that because uh, as much as he might like to add certain flourishes it might not be respectful really to the culture if that's just not how the art style was done you can't impose your own characteristics on that so i think he managed to do that job not only in making sure it's it's clear and bringing his own style to it but making sure that he was considerate of the source material and to actually bring it back to the question you asked earlier about the european sources and using those influences there are limitations when we're talking about these things from the Islamic world, for example, you don't have the depiction of people conventionally to avoid idolatry uh, within that. And so this is one of the reasons also there was a little bit of concern about the depiction of Musa in the game as character when you're dealing with that culture. And there is one depiction that you can see of Musa on the board uh, where he appears in the, the law area and he's a start player marker as well and i noticed that for this conversation you've used that same image in the background from the catalan atlas there yes. and that obviously does mm. come from a european source originally so there was a slight concession there because we did want to you know you have this trade-off of sticking entirely to the original style which is never going to be possible because you know the, these are manuscripts not board games that they have there and allowing people to engage with the history and hopefully in a way that's somewhat informative and by including for example musa there this is the sort of thing we know already from people that mm. play tested it or have demoed it have then gone on to 
go and find out about this history and look at it. And so leaving those little trails there and enticing people to hopefully go away and explore, do a bit of research themselves. Yeah. Which, which might be absent if you don't have those kind of those hints to push them in that direction. I want to go back to some of the questions that got asked on PGG that are more specifically looking into uh, thematic implementation, mm -hmm. uh, like ideas uh, into the into the mechanics. And there is a couple of questions from Chris that I think are, are interesting and maybe very specific. So if you haven't played the game, it might feel, feel a bit confusing. But if you haven't played the game, I would recommend that you go and play the game. So that's the, <laughs> so that's, so that's, so that's the thing. But Chris is asking, is there a thematic relevance to the low discipline being a catch-all and being the place where you mostly get the skill tiles uh, and what do those skill tiles uh, represent? Yeah, so uh, the skill tiles represent basically various academics or experts that uh, come to your school and learn teach in your classes. You can build some story around every of the actions in the game. So when you do a low action, basically you're sending a student to solve a dispute at the palace. So the low area is the Mansa palace. And there will be a dispute about uh, something I use. I'll solve the dispute. And that uh, impresses uh, a bystander, some, some of the experts there say, okay, I'll come to your school. And that when you put the tile on your uh, player board, every time you teach a class of that discipline, you get the bonus, which is like what that uh, new teacher is doing is contributing or is that contributing to the to your, to your teaching and that's kind of the the story now mechanically yes we needed the afford uh, disciplines and uh, the the economy was based on the three things books salt uh, and gold it's not something we invented so gold was very uh, easy to get in the Mali empire was very looked after abroad so you send the, the gold abroad you get the salt from the saramines and use the salt for your local expenses so basically when you send the students to copy a book from some mosque you just uh, give them some salt for the expenses and then it comes back with the book so that's kind of the the resource group and then when you bring the book to the library Mansamus rewards you with some gold because he has plenty of that and so these three disciplines are kind of linked by the three resources. Now, law is something that uh, affects everything. It's not just uh, one of the three, the three resources. And so we ended up with using law as a way to improve your schools in, uh, in all directions, not just for a specific uh, uh, and I guess maybe a, a follow-up question to this that is in the same realm. Uh, people are asking, why are you building walls when you're... Uh, yeah, so, so you need to do some abstractions because yes. you cannot uh, make players solve mathematical problems uh, as a, an action in the game, right? Why not? So why not? Awesome. what happens, uh, to what uh, the whole thing represents is this. During your uh, various things you do in the game, you encounter some problems, which are the Sankore tiles. So you bring this problem to the university to be studied, so you put them in the university. In a very abstract way, people will look at the problem from different directions until they solve it. And uh, and so when you're putting mm -hmm. a, a wall on the on the board, it's just that uh, you are, uh, that's your contribution to that problem. You need to put a piece to remember that you did it. That's a, a mechanical thing. It cannot be completely abstracted. So you put a, a mosque on the mosque in the theology area, but that doesn't mean you build the mosque. That means you are a relationship with that mosque. You put a tent on the Sahara, you didn't really, the students were not pulling up tents, they were guiding the caravans. You put the tent to say I went there. And so mm -hmm. in the Mat area, you we put the wall because uh, of the shape of the San Korea mosque, which has this kind of wall around it. But what it means, so you are, uh, helping solving some problem at the end of the game so when you acquire the problem you get a, a, a reward because you're bringing something to do at the university then you contribute to the problem with you build the wall you flip the tile at the end of the game different people looked at that problem and then the most important like professor that look at the problem get the reward like the yeah. uh, merit for solving that that's like the very abstract thing that's happening beyond the mechanical put a piece and uh, count the numbers, right? Yeah. 
But yeah, you have to do some structure. You cannot, uh, you know. Otherwise, mm -hmm. all games becomes uh, get the bricks and build the house. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Previously, we did have it that you were, um, you know, applying mathematics in architectural sense, and you were building spires to it because there's these kind of distinctive uh, spires that are common in the architecture, and there are uh, three of those, I believe, around the actual Sankore Madrasa on the side. So they would be a nice little distinctive feature, and that's what we were using in the prototype, and that was the thing there. But then it also becomes somewhat away from the theme when people do a lot of that activity and you have, you know, 10 spires surrounding mm -hmm. this thing, which has started to deviate too dramatically from the, from the reality of these being scarcely dotted around the different madrasa. Yeah, we adjusted that. But also, you know, um, for our own consideration in the design and the history and the accuracy of that, we did have to think, because I, I think, be curious to hear if Fabio has a, a different opinion on this, but earlier on in the design, when we had laid out what the disciplines would be, both Fabio and I come from a sort of hard science type background. Uh, and I think we overvalued maths, basically. <laughs> when we were thinking about what classic, these different disciplines classic. would do, yeah. we were thinking, well, maths is obviously the best thing you could do. <laughs> so it's got to do this. And initially our intention had actually that it sort of underlay everything else you know, that maths was so foundational to your understanding of all these things that it, it had this uh, broad effect, the way that law actually interacts with other things. Now, maths was initially going to be this kind of, well, obviously, it's just going to make everything better having mm. this good. And I, I think there was, you know, it had to be a bit of a, an understanding of the theme yeah. as it actually is, rather than our own <laughs> uh, biases coming in to depart a little bit and say, well, we can't just say that maths is, you know, the best thing and, <laughs> and maybe theology is not as, uh, you know, valuable to, to a society and so on to, uh, to readdress that. It would have been a really good example of designers' bias coming into their design when <laughs> so that would have been uh, quite interesting. Maybe uh, to to bring a bit of a, a start going to the close of the conversation, I was wondering, and you hinted a bit at that, Mandela, a bit earlier, what do you hope that the players take away from uh, the experience of uh, playing this game in terms of mostly historical understanding of just generating the curiosity? What do you hope that happens after a good game of, of or a few games of Sankori? What they take away, well, I mean, obviously, we want people to enjoy the game as a game and engage in it that way, but from the historical aspect it's a large part of it i think will be simply awareness of this setting because it is new to so many people that we've introduced the game to because obviously most of the audience that we're talking about end up being sort of uh, european or maybe north american uh, audiences that encounter this sort of thing and some of them may have heard the name mansa musa it's it's rare that people are aware of the rich history that's there and from from that it would be really good if they take away an understanding that the history of, of education, of pedagogy, is not one that is owned by one particular culture, as it seems to be a sort of prevalent school of thought that I encounter quite a lot, um, that people seem to think that education, that our understanding or even our curiosity to explore the world in an academic sense is something that comes from a particular uh, culture which seems to have gained this dominance over it in that uh, in that sphere so just understanding that these institutions these approaches it might vary a little bit from say the european model of these but are also important and valuable historical remnants of academic endeavor and persist to this day i think that is is something that would be really important to to bring to the fore and you know, I, I work in an educational setting as well. I work at university. And again, because of how we view universities, we see this as very typically, I think, you know, we think of the, the sort of headliners, which are all Western European, really, or uh, North American. You think of your Oxfords and Cambridges and stuff like this. So we see that whole history leading there when that's not, not the reality of things. And I think that that, has spread not only within Europe, but I do a reasonable amount of work in West Africa as part of my work. And I think even in those regions, people have overlooked a lot of this history 
because it doesn't have that, because a lot of the narrative that then seeps into the global interpretation of these things is coming from uh, these same regions, that it often gets overlooked even in the territories where where this stuff happened, where this great history is is lying. And maybe just to to conclude the question to to both of you uh, regarding maybe future projects, are there other topics that you are con like either exploring right now for current games or considering exploring in the future? And maybe we can start with you, Fabio. Well, there are lots of them, but <laughs> this one will actually end up being a game recently. <laughs> but yeah, so lately I've been trying to widen my horizons, so try to to find topics that are not the usual ones, but uh, it's not uh, always easy. If you want to know like what I'm working on or like what... Yeah, uh, I think that would be, yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, so I have a couple of games going up in the next uh, couple of years, and one of them is with Mandela, and another is with Nestor Mangola from the same time we added the uh, bandwidth. So with Nestor, I work on more uh, like contemporary subjects, and with Mandela, more historical ones, let's say. <laughs> and you don't want to talk about the topics yet? Well, I mean, the one with Nestor is about uh, the Artemis missions on uh, the moon. So it's yeah. Shackleton base, will come out of Essen. And the one with Mandela is about Peruvian uh, regions, uh, stories, but maybe you can talk more <laughs> yeah. about that. Tell us more, Mandela. <laughs> um, yeah, well, maybe I will be a little bit reserved about that because I don't know how much the publisher uh, wants to disclose but one of the challenges I think about uh, Fabio and I designing together is finding that that theme that setting that really hooks and draws us in unfortunately uh, fortunately yes in this other case we we also had a setting which is more I guess closer to my own um, mm -hmm. uh, background and is taking also this approach of building something up from that theme and exploring what we thought was a fascinating story. Uh, that one crosses more over into myth uh, mm. than just the reality, but covers also a little bit and hopefully introduces some people into some of the history of that area as well. So quite excited to see that one come out. Uh, and when we can talk about more of it, be very happy to do so. Yeah, and I hope you'll be back on the show to talk about it. That would be great. <laughs> Thanks for saying without saying too much, I guess. Uh, that should keep the publisher happy. This is what we want. But it was it was a great chat. Thanks a lot for, for that open conversation about all this. Uh, it was super interesting. Are there maybe any other last thing that you want to say before I end the recording? Or we're good? I think just thank you, yeah. For... Yeah, you're very welcome.